Well, last week we looked in an extra long study at a first part of several things that I intend to cover on these open Wednesday nights that we have. Serious fallacies in non-charismatic reasoning and thinking. And we were looking at the subject of church order and restorationism. It's very clear to anyone who will be honest enough to open their eyes and look around that God is restoring the church today Amen. with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And I want to look at something that's related to that and that perhaps is even more serious than that, what we looked at last time tonight, another serious blunder of the first order and a fallacy in non-charismatic teaching, and that is the claim that revelation and scripture are inseparable or that that revelation and scripture are synonymous different ways you could say it but i think that eventually we're coming around to say the same thing or you probably heard it more often like this that revelation ceased with the first century that there has been no more revelation given by god to the church since the close of the first century. And so in light of our study last week, I would say about that, well, it's a surprise that we don't have any more revelation because I wonder how the church got the way that it did. Certainly not the church of Scripture. Somebody's been giving them some type of revelation that's either contrary to Scripture or in addition to Scripture to complete the canon or something because we could just start with, oh, anything from choirs to uh, robed trained clergy and you won't find that anywhere in the New Testament you know isn't it interesting that the very people who claim that there is no revelation apart from the Bible are the people um, who we see most quickly disobeying the teaching of the Bible but they had never claimed that as disobedience uh, and they would never claim God's restoring the church their only claim would be that, that scripture and revelation are the same and they stop with the first century and the pattern of the church is pretty much a mystery whenever you try to read the Bible. Well, if that's true, I guess we would need extra revelation to know, well, what does God want for the church to be? What should the church be like if it's such a mystery in Scripture, as we saw last week according to them? The only thing we can determine definitely about the church is that the pattern of the first century was in continual change. Well, then how would God want us to live and act in the body of Christ today? So, uh, let's look at this matter tonight. <clears throat> it is so serious, uh, it's almost more serious, it just probably depends on how you're looking at it or what you're discussing, whether last week and that claim was more serious, that is, more serious of a blunder and mistake than tonight or whether tonight's is. But this paints a very pessimistic uh, outlook on life, as you're going to see when we get through tonight, of uh, the claim that's being made that there's no more revelation. And I mean, by revelation, that's a big inclusive term. We're going to get into some of the various areas and some of the uh, uh, patent falsehoods and false caricatures that some of the non-charismatics try to paint of us, like we're trying to write a new Bible that's on the same level doctrinally as the New Testament. We'll get to that later. But for them, it includes everything. There's no revelation. There's no leading of the Spirit. There are no impulses. There's no guidance at all nothing but what you find in scripture and by that they won't allow you to say well the spirit the scriptures say the spirit will guide me no they'll say the only guidance you find if you find any will be right in the bible that will be your guidance uh, so that it gives you you know these broad general uh, pr some specifics but broad general principles to follow you follow that in your life and that's what we call you know guidance that's for them guidance but there's there's nothing that is comes in any immediate sense from the Holy Spirit. No impressions, no thoughts, no leadings, no promptings, no impulses, uh, no certainty in your heart that you're doing the right thing whenever you have to make a decision that's just not covered in Scripture. Um, that's a pretty pessimistic outlook on the Christian life. Now to them, they think it's a very optimistic one because they think what they are doing, I mean, I'm, they think they're doing God's service by championing the supremacy of the holy scriptures and they really think they're doing god a service to try to keep people bound to the scriptures 
with that meaning that there's no revelation outside or apart from them. And we're going to show you that the scriptures themselves contradict that. If they would just stay with what they say, they should and we should stay with the Bible by the Bible itself from cover to cover contradicts the notion that revelation and scripture are or ever were inseparable or synonymous. I guess they're thinking that there's a lot of confusion of, of people and what happens when you have one person, person A, claiming that the Spirit has showed them to do this and person B claims the Spirit has showed them to do this and they're both involved in the same thing but the revelations are contradictory. Well. To be sure, there are a lot of problems in the charismatic movement with some of their claims of revelation and God told them to do this and told them to do that and so forth, but I suppose I'd rather have to deal with some of the confusions and at least have the possibility that God still does speak today than opt for this pessimistic outlook that you're just left on your own. Amen. You have no guidance, no leading, no help, not even inner voices or assurances that the decisions that you're making or have made are the right ones to make. They don't allow any of that. Because to these non-charismatics, and I mean almost all of them, non-charismatics feel this way, almost all of them, there's just no revelation being given outside of Scripture. I think that the neo-orthodox accusation that on occasion has been leveled against conservatism of bibliolatry is really true whenever it comes to the non-charismatic position. They have enshrined the Bible, they have put it on a pedestal, and it is a sufficient, uh, infallible, inerrant word. Uh, we're conservative conservatives around here when it comes to inspiration and inerrancy, but they have put that on a pedestal in a way in which God never intended to take place. They, these people and their, their logical approach to everything, their intellectualism, their um, claim that what we have in Scripture is a propositional revelation, and, and I don't dispute that, but I think a lot of the claims that have been made and that are being made out there in the non-charismatic church have been made, just like some of the charismatic mistakes, in overreaction to liberalism and neo-orthodoxy. Uh, I don't mean to get too technical in a little simple study tonight, but you know the neo-orthodox people, like Emil Bruner with his books on Scripture and Revelation, uh, Bruner claimed that scripture was personal and you know how th that can be easily twisted then I mean let, let's let's see how it can be twisted before we see exactly what could be said and of course Bruner meant it to be in the twisted form the scripture is personal well, what you end up with then is that scripture means whatever you want it to mean scripture means whatever you make it out to be and so here came the uh, conservative uh, cohorts along no scripture is not personal scripture is propositional and before you know it, you've gone from, you know, a literal interpretation to a literalistic interpretation of things so that you've so divorced Scripture, the propositions put down there from the dynamic power and ministry of the Holy Spirit that you have dead letterism then. There's nothing wrong with the letter of Scripture, but when you do that, you've reduced Scripture to dead letterism. That's the same thing the Jews were guilty of of the Old Testament. They had memorized whole sections of the Pentateuch and the prophets. They were so knowledgeable, they, they could quote it backwards and forwards, and yet it had no life, no meaning to them. They had reduced it to dead letterism. If you would have asked any of the Jewish leaders, you know, who wrote the Pentateuch or when was Daniel written, well, they would have had the conservative answers for that. They would have known immediately the correct answers to those questions. That didn't produce any life in them, though. Evangelical conservatism today, I think, finds itself in the same position, and it's overemphasis on the fact that revelation is propositional, that, that revelation is not just what it means to you, that it is what was meant by God whenever the scriptures were originally inspired, and they were the things inspired, not the men who were writing them. That might have been a byproduct, but the word is what is inspired. It is what is God-breathed, 2 Timothy 3.16. Well, that's all fine and well, and that's true. But I think what we have here, as I said earlier, is probably an overreaction to some of the neo-orthodox claims of Scripture being you know, something personal that involves you. I think that Bruner was exactly right. Now, what he said by his statement was wrong, but Scripture is personal. 
If it's not personal, it's dead letterism then. If it's, it is personal, if it's not, we really don't have any hope. We just have a, a book of laws here to us that are divorced from life and divorced from the Holy Spirit, and God never intended it to be that way. But Scripture is personal, but then we would want to go on to say after that, follow up the neo-Orthodox claim that Scripture is personal, we don't want to go on after that to say that it's also propositional because how else can one person reveals something to another person without talking to him or writing to him. In other words, in statements. You have to be given statements or two persons cannot communicate. So in other words, I think that those have been posited against one another in a false manner. It's either personal or propositional. I think it's both. I mean, this, this is getting a little technical for you, but maybe I have to go back earlier here in our thought before I go any further tonight to make this statement because here is where the conservatives are missing it today. They have a Bible that they bow before they worship. I'm not talking about anyone who's anywhere left of center on inspiration or inerrancy. I mean people who believe this is the Word of God, the very Word of God, breathed out by God, inerrant in the autographs. And the inerrancy, for the most part, extends to all future copies as long as those copies are in agreement with the autographs. I mean, conservative people when it comes to that, when it comes to that. But when it comes to maybe really understanding what God meant in the Word, probably to maybe some of them, I'd sound like I, tonight, am left of center. But uh, we can't say everything. We've got all of our other tapes on what we believe on inspiration and inerrancy. But what we don't have is some codified list of dead laws of letterism that don't speak to us today. That the only way you can know anything is know the original languages, know the history and the archaeology, and then you might know what was said many thousands of years ago, but how does that apply or how does that reach us today? I think that the reason these people uh, first came up with this notion, of course, they lost the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see by the time we get through that what this amounts to is a sliding of the Holy Spirit and of his ministry. Uh, what we have done is we have bound and gagged the God of the universe. We've got made God into a deaf mute. Or he's a mute. If he's not deaf, he's a mute. He can't speak. But I think the reason why some of the conservatives in the last couple hundred years have come up with these ideas is their desire, and it was a proper desire, a pious one, to safeguard the truth of Scripture uh, against you know, acceptance of any other sacred books. This gets into the study of canonicity then. You know, the extra-biblical revelations of, of a Christian science person or um, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. You know, these are a couple of religious groups who have their own extra-revelations that are in addition to Scripture and more than that that are contradictory to Scripture. And so the desire was we've got to find some way to safeguard We've got to find some way to safeguard truth. And so what we'll say is truth, the giving of it, the revelation of it, stopped at the end of the first century. Of course, that's a neat little system to come up with because if that's true, then you categorically can rule out anything that's ever come since then. I mean, if, that, if you can first of all prove that, then that's a great system. I mean, that's just perfect. That rules out all revelation which has ever come since the end of the first century. But well, we've got to back up and see whether or not this can be proven to begin with that revelation stops with the first century. Uh, like I said, it gets into a study of canonicity then. And you know what they would be hard-pressed? Now, we've got a lot of tapes on that, but listen to what I'd like to say to them and see what their answer would be. I mean, this would be a question I would ask them and see what their response is. Give me a shred of scriptural evidence. Give me a verse that proves that the close of the canon of scripture came with the death of the apostle John. Give me a shred of scriptural proof. Now you think yourself, you try to give me something by the way. Give me a verse in the New Testament that says that's the end of scripture, the end of, of revelation that's going to actually be on the same level with the revelation in the Old and then what became the New Testament. Well, I can be quiet for a few more seconds and, and keep waiting. You won't find a verse for that. Now, we've done a lot of study on it. 
And you, if you will remember the way you, you, you come up with this notion that the canon closed, that the, the canon as far as the books that were to be in the Bible, now that, we never made the claim that Revelation stopped, but the canon of the books, sacred writings that were to be a part of the scriptures, closed at the first century, is through a whole lot of processes of deduction and a study of history. And they're always the ones who are saying, now, you people are beyond Scripture and your claims of revelation go beyond Scripture. Well, we'll ask you then, give us Scripture for the fact that canon closed with the first century. Yeah. A verse, just one verse for that. You think of it on your own. You won't find a verse for that. I mean, that's interesting right there. I know what we've said before, and I stand by that. I, that seems to be what has happened, that, that the canon of Scripture did close. But where's the verse that ever said that? You have to look in a historical process in the first four centuries, see which books went where, and what groups accepted which of the books. And there was a lot of discussion and controversy in the early church over that. Some groups wanted to accept this, and some wanted to accept that. And you have to, the only way you can get any type of, quote, proof, unquote, is this big, broad umbrella discussion called the providence of God that God in his providential concern in working. And by the way, there you've got some type of working of God outside of Scripture. Amen. God in this, this umbrella providential working somehow got it, and the Catholics never agreed with this, so he wasn't successful in convincing everyone of this, or the Greek Orthodox for that matter, or a whole lot of uh, sub-splinter Christian groups in sin. Yeah. I mean, Protestants, I think, are arguing from their own denominational heritage is what it amounts to. They, they really are based on it. They might be right about some things, but they're right not because they've seen them in Scripture. They're right because it's based on denominational heritage, which perhaps itself is right. But the point is they themselves have based that on something that's not in Scripture. Well, are you following what I'm saying? Where's a verse that says the canon is closed? For the Old or for the New Testament? What would happen if the true 1 Corinthians or the 3 Corinthians happen to be discovered today? See, I know we've discussed that, how it seemed there were other books written. Perhaps they were the very word of God. But we're not told anywhere in Scripture that every... And by the way, see, here's another whole point in all this. We're never told in Scripture. I mean, there was a lot given as revelation that's not in the Bible. I mean, even these guys hold to that. Not everything God has ever said or did or revealed to a prophet or an apostle is in the Bible. Well, they even admit on 1st and 3rd Corinthians, if you follow the reasoning of the four books of Corinthians. Well, even they will agree with that. I mean, then what you're saying is there must have been another purpose in God giving revelation to a prophet, an apostle, someone, than to get into the canon of Scripture. I, that is a major point upon which this whole fallacious ship is crashed then. It's false reasoning. That very point that I just made becomes extremely important, and you'll see so by the time we get through here. Because what they're doing, they're equating revelation and scripture. They're synonymous. They're inseparable. End of the Bible is the end of revelation. But we've already said earlier that there was much other revelation, special revelation, verbal revelation, given to the prophets and the apostles, as well as other people in the history of Israel and the church that never made it into Scripture. So that means that the purpose of revelation is not to put it in the Bible. Just because charismatics claim today that God is still giving revelation, that doesn't mean they're saying it ought to be in the Bible, or it is on the doctrinal level of the revelation that's given in Scripture. Charismatics don't claim that, not the ones that I know. I've never claimed that about any revelation I've had, that, well, now we should be writing a new book here and put all of these new ideas that I got in this new book. Now, you'll often find the charismatic position falsely caricatured as that, as a bunch of people who aren't satisfied with the Bible and who go with this pneumatic exegesis, just whatever the Holy Spirit gives them is what they believe is true, and then they say, in essence, what we have is people writing a new Bible. Well, I like the reason that's behind this. We ought to want to safeguard the truth that God has given us uh, against acceptance of other sacred, however false, uh, religious writings, such as those of 
Christian science or Mormonism. I think that's admirable to want to safeguard the truth of the word against acceptance of these other books. But what I don't think is possible is any clearly defined, neatly set forth list of criteria uh, by which we can know, now, is this something that has come from God or is this something that's not come from God? I mean, obviously it can't contradict Scripture, but then what about all the personal types of revelations that are and can be given that, that can't be judged by Scripture as far as does this contradict Scripture? You see what I'm saying? I mean, it might be in a personal area that you can't go back to the Bible and say, now, does this agree with the Bible or not? That's what a lot of these people are asking for. What they want is, is a neat uh, system of rules and principles by which we can judge everything. Uh, I think what has happened there is the intellectualism and the rationalism of the Renaissance period has uh, too much affected modern evangelical Christianity. The Holy Spirit is infinite in his wisdom and knowledge. He is dynamic in his ministry. Who are we to think that we can come up with a list of rules or principles and say, now, by these, we can determine whether the Holy Spirit has spoken or not? I think we have seriously uh, misconstrued, we have willingly blundered in our knowledge of the infinite God of history and of the universe. He is a God who is sovereign. He is a God who is free to express himself in any form, at any time, to anyone he desires. These people are willingly ignorant of that fact. Because, I say willingly, because somewhere else in their textbook on theology they'll teach on the sovereignty of god but when it comes to revelation oh no 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 he, we won't let him speak today he only speaks in scripture that's the end of revelation that's the only type of revelation is the revelation of scripture we have seriously underestimated god we have we have made a god in our own image we have reduced god to man's level <laughs> to say that the infinitely free god of the universe is not infinitely capable with all his wisdom and knowledge and power to reveal anything, anywhere, to anyone, at any time, in any method. Charismatics have a good grasp on this. God is free. God will not be bound by we puny human, human beings here. God will not be bound by us. He's free. If God wants to audibly speak to you, and tell you, turn left at the corner instead of right because he knows there's an ambush of people down the road who are going to attempt to slaughter you. He's free to do that. There's not a verse in the Bible that says he's not free to do that. Now, the whole scriptures contradict that. My claim tonight will be that this claim that there's no revelation outside of scripture is itself a revelation outside of scripture. Hallelujah. It is itself a revelation outside of Scripture. And it comes from below, not from the Word of God. And we're going to look at the passages that say this. I'm just giving you kind of a common sense introduction. We wouldn't even have to open the Bible. We know enough common sense-wise. We have our own understanding from being Christians as well. God is sovereign. He's free. And don't give me this business, well, he's bound to his Word. Um, his Word is free. It's not like a lot of the evangelicals want to make it out to be that God's bound to his word. The, the fact of the matter is, and the way that we really should say it is this, God will never contradict himself because he has internal, internal, has internal consistency, unlike the rest of us. You know, we're not consistent in what we say or do. God is always consistent with himself. He's always consistent with his truth and with his will not that God is bound by scripture uh, the truth of the matter is he'll never contradict scripture but that's not because God gave a book and now he wishes he could say something that contradicts it it's because God when he gave this knows and knew all things and he could never contradict himself that's what we mean if we ever say that God is bound to his word it's not so much that he's bound himself to a dead letterism here but that internally he is consistent that's his nature Contrary to what we are, that's his nature. 
And so let me start on this foot here then. Uh, this business uh, of Scripture revelation being synonymous, inseparable, the one is equal to the other, is actually denied by Scripture itself. What you've said here is that there's no revelation outside or apart from Scripture. I want to just show you the fact that there were many forms and methods of revelation. Uh, for instance, in the Old Testament. Uh, let's start back in the patriarchal period. The patriarchal period, God, well, and by patriarchal, I mean all the way back to the days of Genesis, Adam and Eve and so forth. The patriarchal period, God revealed himself by audible voice, by audible voice to not only people who, well, not to anyone who became a writer of Scripture, by the way, but not to people who were only some type of prophet or an apostle. I don't think we'd fit Adam and Eve as in either case, or certainly not Cain. God appeared to Cain, did he not, and spoke to him? Now, he didn't speak to him through Scripture. Scripture wasn't written then. Moses wrote about the story later. How did God talk to him? Talk to him in an audible voice. Now, you see, this is your own presupposition to say, well, it's all right for God to have spoken that way earlier, and he can speak that way continually up until the close of Revelation, the close of the canon, I should say, is what they would say, the close of the canon, then he won't speak that way anymore. That's your own presupposition. That's never supported in Scripture. You see, we have a, we have a false construction uh, of the evidence here. Maybe I should say it another way, a false conclusion to the construction of the evidence. We've got the fact that God is revealing himself, uh, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, in diverse ways, in many ways, to the people of the Old Covenant. In many different ways, not just in one way, not just through Scripture to them, in many different ways to the people of the Old Covenant. And he continued to reveal himself in different ways throughout Old Testament and New Testament history. True so far. And then whenever the last book of the Bible is written, then God from that time forward only speaks through the Bible. Now, that is a false conclusion because the Bible never supports that. Who's to say that the close of the canon necessitates the fact that God will only from that time forward speak through the canon? Who's, who's to say that? The Bible never makes that claim. Now, this is the infallible, inerrant, sufficient, clear, perspicuous revelation of God. But that revelation I've just described with all of those neat adjectives never makes the claim that the evangelicals and conservatives are making today. Now, we're making some big claims ourselves right here in what I'm saying to you tonight. The Bible never says that's the end of God speaking in any other way except through Scripture. The Bible never makes that claim. Chapter and verse, they can't give you one for that. They go through a long process of of analysis, of canon, of, the, uh, of apostolicity, of the apostolic prophetic offices, and all through this, and sounds like scholarship to me. <laughs> scholarship often has some interesting ways to see things, but they end up oftentimes, too often, I'm afraid, with wrong conclusions. It's because they have intellectual biases against the truth. That's just inbred in them, in their higher learning and training. They have intellectual biases against the truth. I mean, an intellectual, look at here, he's got a book he can study. He can study it in the original languages. That appeals to an intellectual. To have God appear in your bedroom as a glowing fire or light, that would scare an intellectual out of his PJs. That's more for charismatics or something. And that's why they say, well, that doesn't work for you guys. I think you've got an intellectual bias against it. A book with propositions in foreign tongues appeals to you because you're a scholar. But promptings and leadings and impulses and inner voices and warm feelings and audible voices and visions and dreams and personal appearances, oh, that's more than they can handle. They've got an intellectual built-in bias against that. Who's to say that that God, I mean, God in all of his power, his infinite power, who's to say he can't appear again in a bush that burns and is not consumed? Amen. You are limiting the God of the universe to say that he can't do that again. Oh, they say, here they get technical. Well, I didn't say he 
can't. I just said that he wouldn't. That's the same thing. <laughs> At the end of the day, you've made the same claim. Amen. Whether he can't, he wouldn't, let's don't split hairs. Oh, well, now, they, they've got to stay right about omnipotence. Well, we know that he can't. You've got to be right with that doctrine of theology, but we know that he can, but we know that he won't. Oh, come on. It's the same claim. You don't really believe God can. Right. If he can, he will. Where does it say that he won't? I mean, here's, here's a man, Moses, and I, we're just looking. I, I'm not going in any specific order here. We talked about personal revelations. Here's another type. Uh, God appearing in a fire in a bush. Now, that doesn't go over very well with intellectuals. <laughs> it, it would take someone like a Moses. But here's a man, Moses, wandering out in the wilderness, leading his father-in-law Jethro's sheep on the backside of the Sinai Desert. And God in his sovereignty and his majesty appeared in a bush, set it on fire with a supernatural fire. We don't have any explanations naturally for that. Set it on fire with a supernatural fire. And Moses didn't know what was going on. Moses didn't expect, Moses didn't say, I think this is God. What did Moses say? Well, here's a bush that's on fire that is not being consumed. I think I'll draw nigh and take a look at it. Isn't that what we read in Exodus 3? And he drew near to that bush, and when he got within a certain distance, I don't know how far, but he was close, a voice came to him out of the bush and said, Draw not thou hither. Take off thy shoes, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. See, that's the God that I worship, the God who's free. The God who's so free he can take donkeys and give them the ability to speak in human language. Or to say it another way, who can speak through donkeys. The God who can command special fishes. Book of Jonah, remember? Special fishes. Who can command them in some supernatural way that's beyond our ability and comprehension. Can command them to swallow up his prophet and then who three days later can speak to him to belch him out on the seashore. And that great fish would obey him. That's the God of Scripture. The God, I mean, he appears, he reveals himself, not always verbally, but it's a revelation of the presence of God in so many different ways. Way over in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 16, God reveals himself in an earthquake that in some way, I mean, an earthquake knocked down the prison, unloosed the bands of all the prisoners. Now, how did the earthquake keep the walls from not falling on top of the men and crushing them? supernatural work of God that shook the prison, unloosened all their bands, set all the prisoners free. That was a revelation. That, that wasn't a revelation of something that Scripture, now Luke tells the story and it gets in the Bible, but that's not a revelation of truth or anything. It's a, revel, it's a personal revelation of the God of the universe. In the Old Testament, he revealed it. Look over in uh, Numbers um, um, chapter 12. The Old Testament, he revealed himself not just in propositions, that is, in the pages of what was written scripture at the time, but he revealed himself in dreams, in visions. I mean, you have to read later in scripture when uh, someone is telling us the story, but in Numbers chapter 12, Verse 6, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak to him in a dream. Now, Acts 2 says those things are for the church and still for today. As we'll see here in a moment, the whole claim of the New Testament is this isn't reserved for just prophets like it was most of the time in the Old Testament. That's the whole claim of the New. Now, here are a couple of different ways of revelation, vision, and by dream and that's not in scripture my servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all my house with him I will speak mouth to mouth even apparently and not in dark speeches and the similitude similitude means the form the form of the Lord shall he behold you want to see that jump back earlier in the book of Exodus chapter 30 3 chapter 33 verse 18 I beseech thee Moses said to the Lord show me thy glory 
And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. Verse 21, the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cliff, really a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts. A personal, visible revelation of God to this man, Moses. What about the Urim and the Tumim, the so-called sacred lots of the Old Testament? Not used in the New, but there was a form of revelation given by God to the Old Testament people. You have many references to this in the Pentateuch, and you've got it right up through the time of David, and then mostly you see the Urim, some after that, and then you get the appearance of it in history. Now, what we evidently have with the Urim and Tumim are sometimes called the Urim and the Thummim, but the Urim and the Tumim, we've, we've got sacred lots that worked on the order of, of all things, dice. Now, you had to pose a question in such a manner that God could give either a yes or no answer because dice can't, you know, give you lots of statistics on something. But let's say that you've got a couple of dice, and on one side they have two singular dots, that is, one, two singular dots on one side. On the other side, they've got one. You roll the dice, and you ask the question in such a way that you know, if the uh, side of the dice uh, comes up, both of the dice together with two black dots on each one, then the answer is yes, or one single dot on each one, the answer is no. And can you believe that they actually roll those things? God told them to do it. This wasn't something they thought of their own. They roll those things, and God answered them by those sacred lots. He answered them by the rolling of dice. That shows his song. In other words, God was so immediately present there that physically he had to control the physics, the physics of the turning and the rolling of the dice so that they would end up exactly, you know, on, on the same side. That took the immediate power of God to do that. We're restricting God to say, oh, the only way he's going to speak is through just the dead letterism and the dead propositions, and that's what it becomes for evangelicals in the Bible. Oh, there's no one who loves the Bible more than we do around here. It's pure. It's been purified seven times over. Uh, it's a buckler to all those that trust in him. It's profitable for instruction that the man of God can be perfect, truly furnished to every good work, 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17. We believe all of that. And because we believe that so much, we're going to let the Scriptures speak for themselves and not put our interpretation on them. That's how I come up with these notions. I'm going to let the Bible speak for itself. That supreme revelation, Scripture, I'm going to let it speak for itself. Casting dice in the Old Testament. And remember that time over in 1 Samuel 28 when, uh, well, just look at this. We're going to be giving you a lot of information tonight. I know I gave you a lot last week, someone was saying. Too much, but we've, we've got it on tape. That's why we have the tapes. You can hear it again. Uh, 1 Samuel 28, verse 6. Remember when Saul has been disobedient now on two occasions and Samuel came to him in chapter 15 and said, Now the kingdom has been rent from you and given to one more worthy. We found that in the next chapter, 16, to be David. Same book, 1 Samuel. Now, Samuel has died in the first verse, I believe, of chapter 25. So Samuel is dead and gone, gone into the spirit world now. And we're right at the end of the life of Saul, the apostate in Israel. King Saul, the first king. And because he is so carnal, so unspiritual, so disobedient to God, he can't seem to get any revelation from God. And look what we have here in verse 6. And Saul inquired of the Lord. The Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Now, if you've understood what I said about the sacred lots earlier, what that means is he went to the priest who had the sacred lot of the Urim and Tumim, and he cast them, and the dice never, you could throw them up 10,000 times, and they never came up with the two dots equal or the one dot equal. That'd take a miracle for that to happen. Just chance would say eventually, if he's posed a question to get a yes or no answer, you're going to get a yes or no. 
In other words, if, you, if one dice would come up with a single, single dot and the other with two dots, it'd be no answer. You can't have yes and no. They'd cancel out. So you'd pick them up and roll them again. One and two, no answer. If you got two ones, the answer's no. If you got two twos, the answer's yes, or however it was arranged. We're not given that information in the Old Testament. But they rolled and rolled and rolled, and I'm sure he rolled a lot. He was desperate to know what to do about the Philistines. He had no revelation in his dreams, no prophets. God didn't send him any prophets. And so the easiest thing, I would think, to get a yes or no answer, just go to the Uri and just keep rolling long enough until you get a yes or a no. No answer. God is sovereign in his revelation. He gives revelation when he wants to. He gives it how he wants to. He gives it to whom he wants to. The evangelicals aren't getting any revelation today because God doesn't want to give them any. They've closed the door on it by closing the door on the Holy Spirit. He is the spirit of truth and revelation. The spirit that came on the prophets that gave the prophecies the spirit that came on the apostles when they were writing scripture is the Holy Spirit. He is the spirit of revelation. <laughs> Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He is the spirit of prophecy and revelation. When you close the door on him, you've closed all hope of revelation. And then what you have to do is invent a theory that explains the absence of revelation in your denomination. You see, they've already lost the experience, and then they come up with notions of why we don't have it. They didn't start with the idea that we're not supposed to have it. They found out we don't have it, now let's justify it. And as the Catholics often claim back in the days of the Reformation and Counter-Reformation, that the Scripture is a nose of wax, it can be turned hither and thither. They didn't like what the Protestants were doing. They thought it was being turned hither and thither. But how true a statement that is. The scripture is a nose of wax. It can be turned hither and thither. You can make it say whatever you want to. It's just broad enough, just comprehensive enough, just difficult, quote, unquote, enough. I mean, it's not just like on Sunday school, first grade reading level, the spot jumped over the log. It's just difficult enough so that you can get things rearranged and make it say whatever you want it to say. If you don't want any revelation to be given today since you feel guilty over the fact that you don't have any in your denomination or church or life or ministry, then you simply make the scriptures say that. And they're just neat d different little ways of explaining it with canonicity or with the uh, apostolate and the prophetic office and, and so forth. Let me show you another form of revelation book of Psalms chapter 19 I like this one because <coughs> this one continues today by the way the early church really is before the actual foundation of the church but in Acts chapter 1 they practice the same principle as the Urim and Tumim they cast lots for the selection of an apostle and God sovereignly directed the casting of the lots I don't know that that's the best way to get your answers to questions because we know that the devil can manipulate physical events like that. But I'd be the last to say that God wouldn't or couldn't, there I got my wooden in, didn't I? That God wouldn't speak to someone that way. Who am I to say that God wouldn't if someone, for whatever reason, I don't practice this at home, like, what should I preach on tonight? Roll the dice there. I don't think that's the best way to do it. I think there are probably other ways to get your messages or to find out answers, but I wouldn't go so far as to say God wouldn't speak to someone if they want to cast dice and, and say to the Lord, now, if I get a seven or a four, then I'm going to take the answer, you know, yes for the seven and no for the four. And anywhere else, anything else will be no answer at all. Am I going to limit God? See, I know the devil can also manipulate, but the devil was alive in the old covenant too. And God so sovereignly protected the sacred law that the devil never could interfere with that. Of course, that was given to them in Scripture as a means of revelation to them. But God so sovereignly protected that form of revelation, the devil never could get in. That has to be true. Or God could have given them that way, and they need an important answer. David went to the lot several times. Lord, are the people going to deliver me up here into the hands of Saul, the people chasing me? Or do you want me to go up against the Philistines? 
Uh, David one time got an answer, no, don't go up. Then the next time, another occasion, he got an answer, yes, go up, and he went up. Well, what if David needs, you know, an answer? Are the people of this city, of Keliah, going to, in 1 Samuel, for instance, going to deliver me into the hands of Saul? And he cast the dice, and the devil got the sacred lot and worked it out, so the answer was no, but really they did deliver him up. Well, David would be in a heap of trouble then. God protected the lot so the devil never got in. And I believe he did the same thing in Acts 1. They chose the right apostle, Matthias. God protected the casting of the sacred lot. And so what about those Christians today who don't know any better and who do this kind of dice method to get a revelation from God? I'm not going to say God wouldn't speak to them that way. Who am I to say that? I mean, who am I to say I'm not the one giving the revelation? Who am I to say God would not speak to them? I don't think you should make a habit of that because as I've said, we've we got to remember we're not given that in the New Testament as an infallible way to interpret the will of God. We're not given that in the New Testament. And the devil can manipulate external objects like that. But who am I to say God couldn't and wouldn't do that? The Old Testament, there was something else in, it's often been used today or spoken of today as a fleece that Gideon put out the fleece, let the water be everywhere else and the fleece dry, let the fleece be wet and everywhere else dry, a supernatural miracle of God. Put the water in one place or the other and kept the opposite dry. Did it twice. I mean, if I knew it was time for a heavy dew, I mean a heavy dew, and I put a fleece out, you know, a fleece from a lamb, a rug, and said, now, God, if you want me to do such and such, let this be filled with water and the whole front yard dry, I don't think I need to do it twice. <laughs> if the whole front yard is dry, that's wet, and all my other neighbors, all the neighbors' yards are also wet. Just my yard is dry. Just around that, I don't think I'd have to ask twice. The point of the matter is, Gideon did. He asked twice, and God gave it to him twice. I mean, God is loving and tender and concerned about people who want to know his will. And I don't remember right now a specific case of my having done that when I first was, um, first was saved or baptized in the Holy Spirit, the fleece or the dice or the lot or the, that type of method. But um, I'm sure I did somewhere along the line. And it's just like an old stuffy intellectual to say, oh, no, you'll never know God's will until you've been to seminary and you've studied the Bible for 20 years. God is just merciful enough, I believe, that he'll just come down and speak to you in some way. He's free to do that. He'll come down and speak to you. Now, let's remind ourselves that as we grow in the walk then, and we grow in our knowledge of God, then, he, then our responsibility grows as well to be able to listen to and discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. We have some earlier teaching on that around here, to be able to listen to and discern the inner voice of the Spirit without drawing cards or casting dice. But I just want to say that tonight, and I, j I feel that God is honored by our being willing to let him be who he is. It sounds like an intellectual who wouldn't want you to cast dice. It just sounds like God who would probably speak to you in some unusual way like that. I mean, the God who speaks through donkeys, through whales, or he can talk to them anyway, large fish, through burning bushes. It's probably the God that can speak through the rolling of dice and the casting of lots. You ever drawn a short or long straw, whichever it was, you know? That's another way that, that's probably not the best way, you know. God, are you calling me to the ministry? I'm going to draw straws and see whether or not. You better have more than that. God, do you want me to marry her or not? Or marry him? I'm going to draw straws. Short, I marry. Long, I look elsewhere. That's not a safe way to pick a partner for a lifetime. <laughs> I would hope there'd be some other things that we would consider in that. But in Psalm 19, let's take a look at a f the first few verses here, Psalm 19, and we'll see another form of revelation that God gave in the Old Testament and that, according to Romans 1, is still true today. Remember what they claim. There's no revelation. There's no revelation outside of Scripture, all right? Now, here's that Scripture you love so much. Here's what it has to say about that. The heavens 
declare the glory of God. They are making a declaration of the glory of God. I mean, glory of God, that's a pretty weighty theological topic, the glory of God. And you can get that. And you see, the point of the matter is, don't give me the business, well, it's in Scripture. That has been true before there ever was a Bible. While there was a Bible in the process of being written, since the Bible has closed, this verse has been true. And that verse would be true if a Bible had never been written. That's the way God has made the universe. That they are in the process of revealing things about God, the glory of God. So I'm going to stay with my claim that the people who say there's no revelation outside of Scripture are themselves giving us a revelation outside of Scripture. The very people who claim Scripture is closed then go on to show Scripture is not closed, evidently, because you've added to Scripture by saying that Scripture is closed, that there is no revelation but what we find in the Bible. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the expanse, all the vast expanse of the universe showeth his handiwork. They say, well, that's just kind of like, um, well, just, well, they don't really know what to say because look at this second verse. Day unto day uttereth speech. And night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no language, no speech, nor language where their voice is not heard. You know, these are the people that love this business of verbal revelation. Well, I just saw speech in verse 2 and voice in verse 3. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. And in them he set a tabernacle for the sun and so forth. As a matter of fact, in this chapter, he goes on then to talk about special revelation, beginning with verse 7. Chapters in a couple of sections here, general revelation, the heavens declare the glory of God, special revelation, verse 7, the law of the Lord. Well, that's the written revelation of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple, and so forth. When I hear in a chapter that does exalt the written word of God, the law of the Lord, and under various other terms, testimony, statutes, commandment, judgments, fear, 7 through 9. In a chapter that sets forth the glory of the written revelation of God, we also have teaching on the fact that in creation, in nature, in the universe, people are having things revealed to them all the time. What do you mean scripture and revelation are synonymous? The scriptures deny that. Scripture is one type of revelation. There are many forms of revelation. It's one type of revelation. Jesus Christ himself was a form of revelation. He came and said, I am here and I'm revealing to you who the Father is. Didn't he tell one of the apostles in John 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I'm a revelation of the Father. I and the Father are one. John 10 30 he that has seen me has seen the father he is a revelation Urim and Tumim are revelation forms of revelation the creation is a form of revelation dreams visions theophanies audible voices they're all forms of scripture is just one form of revelation you see you've taken one form isolated it and discarded everything else that God has ever used to speak to people through or by in the history of his revelation to people. And the one thing you cannot discard, according to the New Testament, if you'll turn over to the uh, book of Romans chapter 1, is this business of God's revelation in creation. Because this is not just something Old Testament. No scholar that I know of has ever said that. Well, whenever the Bible closed, God stopped speaking through nature. You're going to have to make that claim. If you're saying that he stopped appearing visibly and audibly by dream, by vision, since all those are various forms of revelation, you're also going to to be consistent, and they're never consistent. You can't be consistent and be an heir in heresy. You're going to have to also make the claim that whenever the ink dried to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, God stopped speaking through nature. Otherwise, you've got two sources of revelation, at least two, nature and scripture. 
a written form and that kind of mystical, intangible form out there. Well, Romans 1, verse 19, that which may be known of God is manifest... Well, let's, let's get to verse 20. For the invisible things of, God, of him, of God, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and deity. Now, he's going to give us two things that are among those invisible things, beginning of verse 20, which are now clearly seen and understood, his eternal power and deity. How do we know these things? By the creation. Those sound like two topics of theology to me, the deity of God, his omnipotence, his eternal power. And where can you get a little information on that? You can be a heathen down under in Australia and get information on the deity of God and his eternal power. Totally apart. You don't ever have to see, own, open, hear a verse from this written revelation here. And God has given you revelation, has given personal revelation to you, if Romans 1.20 makes any sense to me at all. There's another form found here in chapters 1 and 2 as well, and this also has never ceased to be. Another form of revelation. I mean, revelation that reveals things about God. Now, it's not a saving form of revelation, but it is a form of revelation where God is speaking to people on the earth. Why is it people, all people throughout history, have had their lists of do's and don'ts, of rights and wrongs? They have a moral awareness to them. Where do they get that moral awareness? Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, in the image of God made he them. They are made in the image of God. Conscience, the heart of man, gives him some information. Now, again, don't misunderstand me. It's not a saving information. It can never save a man. Uh, it could be what leads one to, however, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. You won't be saved apart from Jesus. In other words, you won't be saved because you've got the notion in your heart that a couple of things are bad and you shouldn't do them. That'll never save a man. But if you will follow that moral awareness that you have, God may then lead you to the saving type of knowledge, which is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. This message will be continued 